fun. There's a few folks over here who know a secret, which is that I don't know the words to bicycle build for two. But I do know the words to take me out to the ball game, so I sang that one. I want to tell you a little bit and describe the genesis of the sermon this morning. Last spring, a member of our church dropped by my office. He was a member of the last search committee, and we were having one of those heart-to-heart -heart conversations that he and I have every so often, in which we reflect on the ministry of this church. We were having a conversation, and he said, Tom, I want to give you a piece of advice. When you, he didn't say it that way, he said, <laughs> When you come back in the late summer, early fall, I think you should preach a sermon in which you reintroduce yourself. And I was kind of puzzled by that piece of advice, and I thought about it, and I decided that I would take his advice and go with it, which is to say that if you don't like the sermon this morning, it's not entirely my fault. <laughs> But really what I want to do this morning is this morning I want to talk about ministry, and this is in some ways a companion sermon to the sermon I gave a couple months ago in which I talked about a vision of shared ministry and what that word shared ministry, that this word shared ministry meant. But the sermon this morning, the sermon this morning is more about my vision of ministry, about where we might go, and to do that, I thought I might provide you with a little backstory to kind of contextualize why I approach, or one of the reasons why I approach ministry here in the way that I do. So I want to take you back to the fall of 2012. I am 34 years old. I've actually just, just turned 35. And on this particular evening, six years ago, I was at a swanky awards dinner. I was there to receive an award. The Greater Kansas City Women's Political Caucus was presenting me with their Good Man Award. <laughs> given, given to a man who is recognized as an ally and advocate for women's political power. And I have to say, first of all, how cool is that that I actually have in my office a framed certificate? It recognizes me as a good guy. <laughs> I was seated somewhere between the guest of honor, Claire McCaskill, who was at that time pulling ahead in the polls as she ran for the United States Senate, and the awardee um, being presented, the main awardee for the evening being presented with a Lifetime Achievement Award for her philanthropy in the community. That evening, though, I was distracted. I was constantly checking my phone. You see, my wife's due date had been three days previously, and I was pretty sure that they would take back my good man award if I missed out on driving her to labor and delivery because I was at an awards dinner. So I was on my phone kind of nervously texting any contractions yet to her. But truth being, I was not just distracted for that reason. I was distracted because my life at that time was impossibly full. The church I was serving at that time had doubled in size during my tenure and had seen its reputation change from a church that was considered by some to be the worst church in Unitarian Universalism. Now, I actually was at, at denominational meetings and more than one, more than two, more than three of my experienced colleagues came up to me at our reception and said, you know, that's the worst church in Unitarian Universalism. <laughs> Which took me back. <laughs> but, but during, at least it was, and then during the course of my tenure there, it had actually gained a reputation for vitality and innovation. But the truth is, is that my ministry there was really distracted. Most months I was traveling at least one, often two, sometimes three weeks out of town and doing ministry there with whatever time was left. I was going out on the road to 
for example, teach leadership skills to UUs from across the Midwest or in New York, to meet with the UUA president and senior staff to advise them on ministerial excellence, to be the star preacher at a church's 50th anniversary celebration, to give workshops on my book, which the UUA was at that time requiring every seminarian to read. At home, I had been tapped to step in to lead a nonprofit organization that was in the middle of a destructive crisis. It was a bipartisan political organization that was experiencing destructive conflict. Imagine that being possible. And this organization had just driven out its executive director. They asked me to step in as board president to lead a healing process and to convene the search committee for a new executive director. And then I had thrown my weight around and forced the search committee to choose the right person for the job to bring that organization back into solvency and health. My email inbox had a lot of embarrassing unanswered messages. And I'm not talking about the unanswered messages from my parishioners because there were a lot of those. For example, this one. This is the UUA. We're writing again to ask you where the manuscript is for that second book. We've asked you to write. Why haven't you written us back? This is the chair of the senior minister search committee of a prestigious church, not this one. Would you consider applying? And perhaps most embarrassingly, dear Tom, this is the UUA. Just checking in to see if you plan to cash the check for $3,000 we sent you recently as prize money when we awarded you the Westwood Award for Excellence in Ministry. Our records show that you have not cashed the check. I did write back to that one. <laughs> Though I'm embarrassed to admit what I wrote back. I said, I received so many awards, it's hard to keep track of them. <laughs> so I left in the middle of that award ceremony. And as I drove home, I thought to myself, this is too much. And it seems like I've got some decisions to make. One decision I could have made was to keep doing what I was doing. Write another book, go serve as senior minister at that swanky church, run for UUA president in a few years. But driving home, I felt this was stuff that I wanted no part of. These were all things that I didn't particularly enjoy and were burdens on me. See, what I did enjoy was parish ministry, and all that other stuff was getting in the way of parish ministry. But ministry at that time felt like playing whack-a-mole at an arcade. You know that game where a bunch of things pop up and then you swing wildly at them with a mallet? So I would come back find a bunch of stuff in, in chaos, and then I would sort of swing wildly at it, and then leave town and repeat the cycle. In all truth, I was doing ministry with the subtlety of a freight train. I was just sort of, you know, slamming in, and, uh, and it was getting on my nerves. So that evening, six years ago, I began to wonder what it would be like to reinvent my ministry. See, there are some ministries where the senior minister is a larger-than-life public figure living in the spotlight, and the congregation takes on the role of the cheering section, living vicariously through the minister's fame and success. And that sounds miserable to me. So what I began doing, what I began doing was began saying no to the things that did not bring me joy so that I could more fully say yes to the parts of ministry that I found most meaningful. And I found myself, rather than flying back from the road on Saturday night, writing a sermon, you know, scribbling a sermon on my computer in the plane, I began to take more time to craft my sermons and do memorial services for people that I'd actually gotten to know, and teach adult religious education, and do hospital visits, and be available to meet with leaders when they wanted to meet, and 
having the time to visit with the youth group and learn the youth group members' names. To do this meant saying no to speaking engagements, leadership positions, travel requests. And this reinvention of my ministry came to fulfillment when I applied to be the minister here. And I talked to the search committee about really liking committee meetings and potlucks and staff supervision and the minutia of budgets and even board meetings most of the time. <laughs> I remember telling the search committee that I just really liked church. That's what I stressed when I came to meet with them, not awards or accolades or publications or honors or academic success. I just like church, is what I said to the search committee, and the search committee said, you're our guy. And so my ministry here has meant reinventing a personality in ministry that is a little calmer than what it had been previously. I know some of you probably don't think of me as calm, but you should have seen me before. It has meant having to learn not to be the freight train that runs through everything in its path, not always having to have the right answers or being the first person or the final person to speak, not having to be the star of every show. And there's been some learning in this and some challenge in this, but it's felt really good for the most part. I'd be lying if I told you that sometimes I don't wonder if the grass is greener. But I'm pretty sure that it's not. And so it's in that context that I want to talk to you about my understanding of ministry and then conclude by offering a few words about what lies ahead for us during this church year. I believe that ministry, as Gordon McKeeman wrote, is all that we do together. It's what we do together as we celebrate triumphs of our human spirit, miracles of birth and life, wonders of devotion and sacrifice. It's what we do together with one another, in terror and torment, in grief, in misery and pain, enabling us in the presence even of death to say yes to life. This is true, but the other truth is, is that there is a lot of ministry in this way that isn't terribly exciting. Like with spiritual practice, we know that if you want to have a deep spiritual practice, you actually have to practice. To get good at it, you have to do it. Hour after hour, day after day, year after year, I took a trip some years ago to the Green Gulch Zen Center in north of San Francisco. There it's a community of, of spiritual practice, and the day works like this. At 4.45 in the morning, they ring the big resounding bell that can be heard everywhere at the center. At 5 o'clock, the entire community gathers for the first meditation session of the morning, two hours from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. Then they have lunch, work in the fields, or have breakfast, work in the fields, eat lunch, work a little bit more in the fields, and then from 2.30 to 4.30 or 5.30, there is another two to three hours of sitting. And then dinner, and then an evening sitting that is shorter. What I was struck by during my time there was first of all that I wasn't very good at Zen meditation, um, but what I, was, what I was struck by is that this is this commitment to practice that is kind of what is required to do it well. And ministry, I think of in the same way. To ministry, if ministry is all that we do together, then there is a certain a bit of constancy to it, showing up to teach religious education or to visit the homebound, serving the meal at the soup kitchen, witnessing in the public to the political realities that are anathema to our faith, cleaning out the closets of the church again and again, weeding the planting beds again and again, not sexy stuff, but part of this practice. And it is in this practice that we build deeper relationships, make powerful connections, grow spiritually.
In those churches where the congregation is the cheering section for a celebrity minister, when that minister goes somewhere else, there's often this sense of like a hole or a vacuum that is left. But in churches where there is this shared ministry, it all continues, the relationships continue, the ministries continue. I've found in my ministry here deep consolation in a poem by Marge Piercy entitled To Be of Use. And this poem has become one of my mantras for ministry, a mantra that challenges me, that I try to live up to, and I thought that rather than read it to you, we might read it together. Um, I might we share it all together. It's number 567 in the back of your hymnal. 567. I invite you to read with me this mantra. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest, and work in a row and pass the bags along, who stand in line and haul in their places, who are not powered generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. The work of the world is common as mud, washed, it smears the hands, crumbles to dust, but the thing worth doing well done has a shape that satisfies clean and evident. Greek amphoras or wine or oil, hopi vases that held corn, are put in museums, but you know they were meant to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry, and the person for a work that is real. Pitcher cries for water to carry it, a person for work that is real. I want to conclude this morning with just a few observations about our shared ministry in the year to come. My first observation is that in church life, it's often possible for people to, to take a view where they only see the cylinders that are not firing, and to kind of take for granted the ones that are. And so I think my first bit of ministry that I, that I try to do and that I want to encourage us to do is to not take for granted all the things that are strong. This is a church with strong lay leadership, strong volunteerism, strong generosity, a strong program for children and youth, a strong covenant group program, strong music program, strong ministries. So my first observation about our ministry together is um, that even as we try to improve the cylinders that we don't think are quite firing, that we should be really glad and appreciative of the things that are strong. My second observation has to do with how to approach ministry in a time of a building project. So sometime in 2019, we're going to be breaking ground on a new building, a building addition. It might be disruptive in some ways. But as a church, there is a wrong way and a right way, some dualism, a wrong way and a right way to approach a building project. The wrong way is this. The wrong way is to make ourselves the cheering section for the contractors. There's a temptation among some to sort of bring lawn chairs and popcorn and kind of watch them dig ditches and pour cement and, you know, put up, put up drywall and the like, and we're just kind of here cheering that on. Um, I've actually heard of churches where um, members went out and bought hard hats so that they could come walk, walk the construction sites to sort of see things. Don't do that. 
the contractors will not like it, and it's not, it's not very spiritually healthy because rather there's an opposite, which is that churches that kind of, you know, worship the building kind of hold back while it's being, while it's being built, they experience the conclusion of the building as like, ah, job's done, and then they kind of, you know, they kind of, you know, there's, a, there's, there's an energy lag. Rather, during a building project, it's the time to actually be inventive and innovative and try new stuff. I don't mean let the leaders lead, support the project with generosity, but try innovative ministry. Um, for example, one of the things that I've done this year that I'm going to do this year, even though it might be a while to break ground, is that I've decided this year that I'm going to teach all of my spiritual education for adult classes off-site. I'm going to be teaching a class at Carolina Meadows in the fall, hopefully one at Carol Woods in the spring. I'm going to be teaching a class in October at a bar. I'll be teaching something at a coffee shop. I don't know where. I think I'm going to teach a class at the Art Museum. I don't know. But, but my goal is to try to, you know, use this time to get out of the community and, and do that there. And so that's what I mean by, by innovation. There's nothing needs to stop. Everything can be done. My third observation is that we might commit to honoring our legacy as a church, that our church has this amazing legacy, that at a time when racial tensions were extremely, extremely bad in Chapel Hill, when I say racial tensions, I mean white supremacy was really bad in Chapel Hill, this church, its lay leaders and its minister together stood up and dared to be the outspoken church at a time in the early 90s when gay rights and lesbian rights and equal marriage was something that was barely on the radar in most towns in the South. This church, its lay leaders and its minister actually stood up and said, we're going to be the welcoming church here in Chapel Hill. So my third challenge is to commit ourselves, to commit ourselves to making a difference, not for each other, but also for the most marginalized and are most at risk in our current world. We love the world too much to stand idly by. We love our neighbors too much, our Muslim and Jewish neighbors, our immigrant neighbors, our transgender neighbors, our African-American neighbors. We love our neighbors too much <laughs> to be passive in the face of dehumanization. And so my third challenge is to find a way to live, to live into that even more. Here we are, here we go. Come along, let's have a great year. Amen and blessed be. I want to invite you to rise in body and spirit and join in singing. Our closing hymn this morning, it is a hymn about ministry. It is number 298, called Wake Now My Senses. I would ask you to note that there are five verses of it, but they're fast verses. We'll get through it. <laughs> Let's rise in body and spirit and sing together.